songs. And uh, we did that when I was installed, um, ordained actually as a clergy woman in Richmond, Virginia, not too long ago. And, uh, <laughs> 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 feels like a long time ago. In the midst of all the hoopla that was going on this week, I had to come up with a sermon title. And my confession is, I really struggle with sermon titles because I, sometimes I feel like they kind of limit me and I go in a different direction and it doesn't match the sermon title. But all I could think of was, and the hits keep coming. <coughs> that was the only thing that came to me. And and the hits is not necessarily a bad thing. I saw this as kind of a very positive thing. So let's talk about Jeremiah. He was called to confront a political system and an immoral society that really didn't want to hear what he had to say. Amen. Throughout his life, Jeremiah challenged the religious hypocrisy, the economic dishonesty, and the oppressive practices of Judas leaders and those who followed him. <coughs> now, Jeremiah was a voice of warning. The watchman who brings attention to hard truths that others would just rather ignore. He was the pessimist, they called him the weeping prophet, who was in reality the realist. He was dismissed and ridiculed as a false prophet who insisted that God, and those around him insisted that God would never, never, never let the city of Jerusalem fall to an invader. And Jeremiah would pay dearly for his willingness to speak the truth. For bringing God's word to God's people, he would be beaten, thrown in a well, imprisoned, and persecuted continuously. Besides the physical suffering he endured, he would agonize over a nation that wouldn't respond to the grace that God was offering to them. God was asking them to turn back to the ways of God. Jeremiah would beg for his eyes to become found so that he could weep and weep for his people. His choices were taking them further and further away from God. And what was God's consolation to Jeremiah? What were God's words to Jeremiah? You were designed for such a moment as this, Jeremiah. Before you were even created in the womb, I created you Amen. to endure and indeed to thrive during these times in the situation in which you now find yourself. Now, Jeremiah's work as a prophet was anything but stellar. For 40 years, he had insistently hammered away at a, about a single message from God, a message that their country would be destroyed and everything that the people held dear would be gone. Now, certainly that's not a way to win friends and influence people. If I came in here and said, if you don't turn from your ways and turn back to God, God's going to do something terrible to you, and the city's going to perish and all that, the church would be empty, hopefully. But Jeremiah was a person of hope because he held out hope for a restoration but not until after the horrible catastrophe had already unfolded. Very few people had listened or heeded his message, certainly not the king or any of the religious leaders of the time. In fact, they kept trying to kill him for his efforts. And Jeremiah himself found himself into a despair at times, not only at the rejection and ridicule heaped upon him, but simply because of the grinding weight of the message he carried. I can certainly relate to Jeremiah, and I'm sure most of you might be able to relate to him in some way also, because these past two weeks have been full of surprises. And I say, even in the midst of broken glass and boarded windows, I have experienced God's presence in a very powerful way, in this very room. In this very room. Now, Jeremiah, he lived in a time when it was tough to be a prophet. When has it ever been easy to be a prophet? You know, pastors are considered prophets. It's not someone who tells uh, necessarily the future, but who tells the truth, who speaks to the people of God for God. But God knew that the time that Jeremiah was going to be preaching in or prophesizing in was going to be a very tough time. So what did God do? God made Jeremiah tougher. God made Jeremiah tough enough to handle whatever came his way. Now, like Jeremiah, I think that we are living in times when some people just don't want to hear what we have to say. They've got that old tape, those old records going, and they like it back there. God was in this neat little comfortable box, 
if you follow these rules, you're okay. But if you step outside the box, it's going to be weeping and a gnashing of teeth. Whereas, certainly, I don't preach that from this pulpit. Um, I don't believe there's a set. What my rules might be for my living a godly life might be different from what David or Terry or Jackson or Lita or Ken or Dorothy are. Um, I think that's between you and God. I mean, there's some basics, the Ten Commandments we certainly agree with. But I believe that we're living in tough times too, and people sometimes just get uncomfortable when we start talking about God, and especially if you mix in your sexuality with that. People go nuts over that. Um, I don't know why, but and I, I always say to people, well, if it's such a bad thing, why did God create it? Why didn't we just be able to, to recreate humans by you know, doing a special handshake or something like that? It doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> just like these last two weeks have been, and it was for Jeremiah, I believe that God is always working in our lives and in the world around us. And I believe that God is very much aware of how things will be developing and what kind of people will be needed in the moment of crisis or challenge. I believe that each one of you are here today because you had a divine appointment to come and worship here, to be in the presence of God. And your presence here says to me, we are not afraid. We are going to continue to worship and praise and be a positive, loving, forgiving faith community and not let fear make our decisions. And I hope that you don't live like that either. I know some people live in constant fear and life is too short for that. As we struggle with our calling to be prophets of God's words, may we know that others have gone before us and have also traveled through troubled times. Oftentimes, the word of God was spoken to Jeremiah as he was troubled, as he was intimidated, as he was not sure what direction to go to. And God continually reminds Jeremiah, I formed you in the womb. I knew you before you were born. I prepared you for such a time as this. Just like he told Esther when Esther's people were being persecuted, she had to go speak to her husband and kind of say that she was a Jewish woman. And her uncle told her, for such a time as this, Esther, for such a time as this, you've been appointed to go and speak and spare our people. Now, some of us may feel that we are helpless victims. If not here, then maybe in your own personal life and things that are going on. And perhaps you may want to say to God today, I'm just not up to the task, God, of being a prophet. I'm sure there's a lot of foolish people like Pastor Judy who will just jump at the chance to go and speak a few words. And that's okay. When Jeremiah pulled that, he said, I do not know how to speak. I'm just a child. He was just a teenager when God appointed him. And God basically tells Jeremiah, you know, it's not about you. It's not about us. It's about God and God's message to God's people. And I've appointed you. We see from Abraham and Sarah to Mary, the mother of Jesus, Paul, the disciples, people have always found to their surprise that when asked to do something by God, that nothing is impossible. When God calls you, God will also equip you and give you what you need. God says to Jeremiah, as God says to us, you must go to everyone that I send you to and say whatever I command you to say. And God said, I'll, I'll give you the words to say. I'll give you the words to speak. And then God reached out God's hand and touched the mouth of Jeremiah. He said, now I put my words in your mouth. Jeremiah was a timid youth, an awkward teenager who couldn't imagine speaking for God to his elders and to the prophets and the superiors. But God says what God always says when people are overwhelmed, when God asks them to do something. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I am with you. It's the same thing that Jesus said to his disciples as he prepared to leave them. Behold, I am with you always to the end of age. Through these last two weeks, we have continued to share a message of forgiveness and love. And just as God put words in the mouth of Jeremiah, so God has given many of us in here a message to share, putting the words in our mouth, words of love, forgiveness, compassion, and not hate. And I believe that 
by being kind and compassionate and caring that God has richly blessed us through many acts of generosity and kindness as people have stepped forward. People have come forward to offer a donation to us that don't even attend this church. They just saw it on the news and they felt really bad and they wanted to help us. Services have been offered and people have just responded well and we thank people for that. You know, it said that people who plant acorns have a lot of faith and a lot of vision because they'll never live to see the oak tree come out of the acorn. A lot of the work we do, we're not going to see what happens to it. If you're a teacher, you know that, especially in the younger grades. You pour your heart and your soul, everything you have into teaching the students. And sometimes you never hear from these kids again and you wonder, did I make a difference in their life? Did I make a difference? And I know teachers sometimes will get a student that will write them or call them or come back to see them and say, you made a difference in my life. You were the one that inspired me to read a lot or to go to college or to do this or to do that with my life. And I know teachers are, are so rewarded because they're not rewarded financially. So they're rewarded by those students' words um, that they did make a difference. And it's the same way with pastors and people that are involved in ministry. You never know what seeds you're planting and what difference it's going to make in the life of somebody. And I have really been praying for whoever has done the acts of vandal, vandalism. I hope they're watching the news. Maybe they're scared. Maybe they don't have parents at home that are stable. Maybe there's drugs and alcohol in their house. We don't know what's going on with them. But they're obviously troubled. And I would ask that somehow, if you could find it in your heart, to have compassion for them. Amen. And that perhaps God will steer them in another way. If they don't find themselves here at this church, they'll find a church or a place of welcome. Somebody who appreciates and values them for who they are. We're not called to succeed. We're only called to speak the truth in love. So the call is for us as the people of God to simply live and just be faithful to that which we have received, trusting that God will use our words and our actions in ways that we have not dreamed or even could have imagined before. Amen. Our God truly is an awesome and powerful God. And know that you are not alone as you go through this journey. Will you pray with me, please? We love God, I thank you for the prophet Jeremiah and his life, the times he went through. And I thank you, God, for being a God that is filled with grace and mercy, love, and compassion. Help us, O oh God, to follow in the steps of Jesus as we, too, are forgiving and kind and loving. Thank you for each and every person here. They are truly dear to me and to others in this faith community. Together, God, we are your people, and we will continue on this journey. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.